and to yeah. have I mean that's that's why they say don't what's the saying about not having heroes yeah yeah because they're gonna disappoint when you meet them um mm -hmm. okay <laughs> but yeah it'll be interesting to see what how how uh transparent they they will be yeah yeah I heard he's planning to leave come January so yeah, uh, so we'll, we'll find out in January. You know how the, the headlines and the tabloids. <laughs> yeah. so I definitely know how it works. And yeah. I know how soccer drama works. So yeah. we'll yeah. see. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so let, let's go back to your transition from rec to competitive uh, club ball in Sacramento. When you were playing, when you were playing, uh, uh, wreck were there did you have any challenges with like the demographic of the players the um i guess the commute the commitment the cost you know all, all the the typical things that come up nowadays in in you know in football yeah all of the above at different points um when i played recreational so i grew up in a city that had an air force base and I think between that and it just being in Northern California, North Bay of the Bay Area, um, it was always very diverse and, and integrated in its diversity. Um, so I was used to seeing a little bit of everyone for the most part from a very young age. And at the recreational level, my soccer teams really reflected that. I remember my first coach when I joined the Unicorns at age six, I don't, I believe he was black. I couldn't really tell. He was definitely like a, a brown person of color. Uh, my coach after that, totally different team, Las Amigas. Um, she was a black woman. The only black female coach I think I've ever had <laughs> at like age seven. Um, but when I moved from recreational to competitive, that's when it got interesting because for the age group that I was trying out for, maybe I was like 12 or something, 12 or 13. There were three different teams to choose from. There was a team that was predominantly white. There was a team that was kind of like white and Latino. And then there was a team that was like primarily brown, people of color, but like majority Latino. And the first time I tried out, I didn't make any of the teams, which was also like a pivotal moment because that I'll never forget when my mom was like, if you want to make this team, you got to, you got to put in some extra work. And so I start, I joined like an indoor league and just worked on my skills and blah, blah, blah. The next, next year I tried out and I made all three teams and then I had to decide. And I think it was because honestly, I had probably internalized a lot of white supremacy at that point in my life. And I thought that the white, the team that was predominantly white was, I think at the time too, I can't quite remember who, how like each of those teams ranked against each other, but I was somehow convinced that that was gonna be like the best choice for me. And so I joined it and I told the other two teams no, and it was fine. Um, I definitely grew a lot as a player and the team was good. But I remember, and I was not the only, I can't remember if I was the only black player on that team, but I definitely wasn't the only person of color on the team. Long story short, it ended up being one of those situations where the coach of the team's daughter played and she wasn't quite as skilled as other players in that position, but she tended to play more. And because we were competitive, sometimes those kinds of coaching decisions didn't, I mean, you know, there's, you can never make a decision as a coach that pleases everyone, but there ended up being this kind of like division on the club team. I'm sure you guys know about this as coaches <laughs> where there's like the, the group of parents whose kids are like really, really good and want to go to the next level. And then there's the other side where the kids just want to have fun and everyone's <laughs> playtime and let's have pizza parties after the game, even if we had a losing season and the other group is like, you know, can I curse on this? Show? <laughs> I mean, you can, but we don't, we don't, you know, we don't curse. So yeah. oh, okay. Well, I'll I'll stick to the house rules. The, the other the, that that side is like forget pizza parties we need to have more practices and get into more competitive tournaments and blah 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 anyway 
me and my mom ended up being on the more competitive side of things. And I'll never forget, there was one <laughs> game <laughs> where there was like a whole face-off after like everyone had cleared the field and there was this like big dramatic team meeting between both of those groups of parents and the coach. And all of the girls were just kind of like waiting in the car <laughs> <laughs> for them to finish arguing. But uh, I played maybe one or two seasons on that team. Mm -hmm. And then I, when tryouts came around again, I, I feel like I made either all three teams again or the team that I had been playing on and the team that was predominantly um, Latinx. And I was ready to move by then because it was already a hard choice between those two in the first place. And that is when I developed a new dimension of love for the game because it became so much more about, it became something that was more than what was happening on the field. I identified with those players a lot more. So did my mom we did things together, like go to earthquakes games, like our parents would hang out and like, it was very interdependent in the way that people supported each other. And everyone had much more of a unified goal in what we wanted to do on that team. So it was easy to get everyone to buy in. And it just felt so much more harmonious. And yeah, there were sometimes tense moments, I'm sure I don't really remember them off the top of my head, but, and we were good and we had fun, being good and like working hard um and so that was sort of that was when I was like okay whatever I thought good soccer looked like or was clearly I was wrong <laughs> and also this is a sport that can be a ticket of some of sorts it could be like a passport for me because that's also when I started kind of getting into ODP and my world just expanded. My soccer world expanded in the sense of what I was able to do in my, where I lived. And also like my, my soccer world expanded because I started to learn about all the different places that it existed mm -hmm. and how much more grand it was in countries outside of the U.S. Um, and I will always, always be grateful for that. Um, but, but those were my early experiences with, um, things like, uh, diversity and, and the kinds of environments I felt most comfortable in as a player. Um, when at this point, I, from what I can remember, it was all still pretty affordable, um, still financially feasible for my mom, but definitely when we moved to Sacramento and I joined the club team. Actually, that's not true because when we still lived in Fairfield, I remember she had to pick up a second job. She worked like a full-time office job and then she got a second job. Um, my brother also was playing sports, not soccer. He played American football and basketball. But I know for sure that the expenses for competitive soccer probably were more expensive than than what she needed to pay for him to play his sports, except maybe football, I'm not really sure. But I, that's when I started to discover how much of an investment the sport was. Um, and that didn't really, when we moved to Sacramento, she got another job and she was no longer working two jobs. But by then I was already aware of how expensive it was. Um, the other thing that changed pretty like significantly when I moved to Sacramento and joined the club team was that the socioeconomic diversity on that club team um, got a lot wider. Um, I, put, I was now playing with people who were not just like upper middle class, not just affluent, but like wealthy. And I don't think I'd ever engaged with that kind of wealth before. People who treated club soccer as a hobby the way that like an extracurricular at school is a hobby, like joining the debate team type of thing, 
Whereas I knew that I was playing that same sport and on the same team, but my mom at one point was working two jobs to make it work, mm -hmm. to pay for the uniforms and the tournaments and the coaching fees and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and ironically on that club team, the, the players that I could more closely identify with in terms of our socioeconomic situation, the players who also either had like single mothers or came from like the working class, most of us <laughs> were the ones who wanted to play in college. Everyone else was kind of like talked about it a little bit and would kind of like half-heartedly go for it. <laughs> But very few of them ended up playing. And of the few that did, even fewer played all four years. Those of us who did had always had a special kind of bond within the team because of our shared experience, our shared class experience. Mm -hmm. And it's also not surprising that we, those of like those of us in that group were all players of color. <laughs> yeah. um, it wasn't a clean, a clear cut thing. But I can't think of off the top of my head, any of the wealthier teammates that I had who played all four years in college. A lot of them started and did maybe one or two seasons and then quit. Yeah. So I want to have a question because you were saying like when you was on that club team, uh, uh, when you made the travel team, the more competitive one where you have kids that wasn't serious and then group of you, group of other kids or teammates were very serious. So, because we have a lot of young kids that listen to this. So, oh, if you had advice, right? How, how, how did you separate yourself? You being serious and then trying to focus on your goal. What did you do to keep yourself get, uh, going? Um, I sought out other playing opportunities like the Olympic Development Program to make sure that my name was getting out there. Um, and that I was exposing myself to other people who had similar goals as me and where they wanted to go in their careers. Um, I also think at that point, I had sort of embraced an underdog sort of mentality and identity because those both of the competitive teams I played on in Fairfield before moving to Sacramento were were underdogs in a lot of ways because they weren't club teams. So whenever we would go and play club teams, we already had a bit of like inferiority of like knowing that we didn't have the same amount of resources or prestige or like name recognition. Mm -hmm. And that was like five years, four or five years maybe before I even got to the club team. So I already, and then of course, like I was a black teenager in America <laughs> and generally speaking, we're not given much time to sort of figure out how the world works so that we can survive in it. So I think I already had a sense by then of like, because of who I am and how I look and certainly because of who I am and how I look in this sport, in this country, I need to be coming with it no matter what. You know, like even in a game to game sense, no matter like before I even start thinking about where I want to go years from now in this game, I know what people are thinking of me. I know the assumptions that they're making and I need to shatter that somehow, you know? So I already kind of by then definitely already had that mentality. And like I said, because I was, I was fortunate to be on a team with other people who had that experience, it, it was helpful to sort of like be in solidarity with them too. I don't know how, I feel like we definitely talked about it back then, but not super explicitly or with any intention of like, let's form this, you know, group within the group or whatever. But I know that we would do things like, because I lived in Northern California, we would have tournaments in Southern California. And some, some of my teammates would be able to, you know, fly down there and stay at a really nice hotel. And others of us drove down there like, and carpooled and like split a hotel room and would like go to the grocery, the local grocery store in the city where the tournament was and buy food so that we weren't eating out every night because we couldn't afford that, you know? Knowing that I wasn't the only one whose family had to think about things that way or who was even down to share resources helped me helped me stay focused on the goal because knowing that, you know, my mom and my teammates' parents were 
willing to put in that kind of work to support us made us feel that much more obligated to do what we needed to do to make those sacrifices worth it, you know? Um, so between all of those things, I, I didn't even really have to, have all the decisions that I made felt very natural because I knew what was at stake and I knew what the landscape was and I knew what was working against me and was already prepared just through different experiences to, to work against that. So now I don't want to make it sound like any of that was easy. Nah. <laughs> I just have the benefit of hindsight. I'm older and wiser now and know how to articulate it because I've had the chance yeah. to process. But mm -hmm. yeah, that's what that's how I did it. Thank you. And I mean, I'm listening to you and I'm trying to figure out, did you know what you were doing, you know, at that age, right? Like, at say 15, 16, 14, um, did you know what you were doing? Or is it, like, I mean, did you know like your, your appreciation, um, you know, the things you just said, like how you appreciated what your parents, uh, your, your mom, you know, did for you uh, and the things you were going through, or is it more so that now that you when you look back you can yeah. um and part of the reason i'm asking this is because to you know to, like similar to james question to help some of the younger kids that are you know in the same realm that you were in uh that may not be making the best of, of their opportunity or may not be appreciating you know whatever it is and just how to navigate that space mm -hmm. I, I was aware back then, definitely. I mean, I'm also like a firstborn child and between that and being raised by a single parent, I feel like I was always aware of how much more my mom had to do as a single parent in order to make my life and my brother's life feel just as enriched and uh, supported as other kids who were supported by two parents. I feel like I was always aware of that. Um, but I also love soccer so much that it was worth all of my effort. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think I ever lost that first feeling I described to you when I was six years old running down the field and just breathing in and feeling like my lungs would just keep expanding and I could just float away because I was so happy. I never lost that feeling. There were other things that came along with the game as I got older and as it got more competitive that I think threatened it or maybe covered it up a bit, but it never went away. I still have it now. Um, and so, and I've always been a very driven person, I think because of having played soccer for so long and just having been an athlete for most of my life. Um, so I was, I was aware. Um, I also knew that I owed it to myself. You know, I was also sacrificing a lot to be on that team and to, to show up to practice every day. And I've always been a person who try like 100, 150% effort for me is a hundred percent. Like me giving everything I have is me giving 150%, especially to the things that I love. And I mean, sometimes to a fault because I am a perfectionist as a result. And I don't always think that's healthy, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just knew that I owed it to myself as much as I owed it to everyone who had supported me to be as, as good as I could be um, and to challenge myself and to seek out every opportunity to grow because football, like most other things in life, is something that you, whatever you put into it is what you get out of it, especially at that level. So I think I knew. Yeah. Okay. So here, here's something that 
you brought you, I mean you kind of briefly brought this up about the the class situation and the you know your mom working two jobs to afford the game even when you were at the rec competitive and then definitely the cost increased you know as you went to mm-hmm. the higher level yeah to the higher level mm-hmm. and then you, you know you talked about like the fact that the out of that group the the ones who even played at a high level and then continue in college etc were um not the the ones with the financial background or backing mm-hmm. i should say um and this comes up a lot here here in the u.s this you know the catchphrase of pay to play mm-hmm. what's your and and the argument i should say is like pay to play is used as the catch-all for all the ills of u.s football right Mm -hmm. so the reason the national team you know can't do x or or it looks a certain way or you know all the or everything really like everything when it comes down to it that's what everybody oh it's pay to play play play. um so what's your what's your take on that extremely nuanced uh, situation um i don't have as much of a detailed understanding of how youth club teams operate now but i have heard that well i'll get to that in a second based on the experience that i I had back then i think the cost of competitive club soccer was a huge barrier for a lot of kids because it was still not popular enough in this country to to guarantee any sort of visibility if you couldn't pay for it, essentially. Um, I know soccer is probably the sport that by the time I got to college, every athlete that I met, every other like student athlete, no matter what sport they played, played soccer growing up. And that probably is still true now, if I had to guess. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that between the, the limited opportunities for so long at the professional level, for men and women, to be honest, I remember as a, you know, 12, 13 year old, going to San Jose earthquake games and overhearing people who worked for the team while we would be waiting for autographs after the games, talking about how some of those players worked part-time at Home Depot, San Jose earthquakes players, you know? So that never, even back then did not seem like a viable career path, you know? Um, and so between that and the the general lack of visibility, the only way that you could get in front of people who made decisions that could change the course of your life or career was if you could afford it. If you could afford to get onto the teams with the, you know, household name club coaches who had connections with Pac-12 teams or whatever, you know, top 25 universities for women's soccer. Um, it felt very much like a barrier. It felt very much like a barrier. Um, and part of, I, I'm so fascinated by this question because once I stopped playing in college in 2012, I went off, I moved to New York. I went to San Francisco state for school, played there for like three and a half years because I missed that one fall season. And then after graduating, I immediately moved to New York for grad school. Um, And then after graduating, after getting my master's, I started working as a journalist and I was in New York for a bit and then I moved to Kenya. And I, you know, would still play pickup here and there. I would like volunteer coach for youth teams, but I wasn't really paying attention that closely to what was happening to soccer in America. 
And then I moved abroad and was paying even less attention. So I have this sort of gap in, in knowledge between how things looked and felt and how they operated when I was in my early 20s until like my late 20s and, and definitely now I'm 32. And this is kind of as a journalist now what I'm trying to figure out what shifted <laughs> because based on the conversations and interviews that I've done, conversations that I've had, I hear a lot of explanation as to why there are so many more black soccer players in, in the US and non-black players of color, but specifically with black players is because black people have entered the middle class, more black people have entered the middle class and can afford to pay these exorbitant, no offense, I don't know how much your guys' feet are, but <laughs> um, feet. Um, I've heard that from like former U.S. Women's National Team players to like other journalists and comms people and current players. And I've, I've heard it from like various members of like the U.S. soccer, and I don't mean capital U.S. soccer, but like soccer in the U.S. ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And I, I can see that being the case, but I'm also like, we had a whole recession. We had a whole like white supremacist, fascist president, how many black people really entered the middle class? Like, was there a, a boon of like the black middle class that I just like didn't know about? Has it really been that stark? Is that really just the answer? And as a journalist, I just have this, this urge to want to continue digging into that question because it, it doesn't feel like a complete enough answer for the influx that I have seen based on what I know about the socioeconomic landscape of this country mm. the past 10 years. Do I think more black, do I think black people are continuing to enter the middle class? Sure, yes. But that, that entry doesn't seem proportional to the number of black kids that I now see playing the game that I did not see when I was playing. Mm -hmm. So my thoughts on pay to play are sure, but what else is happening here in a nutshell? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I can ask a little bit. I think the game is growing, like like especially play, like someone like me or Mike, where we, when we came to this country from our, our Netherlands. Uh, where are you from? I'm originally from Liberia. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So you're both Liberian, and then Mike, you're He's, Liberian and Nigerian, right? Yeah, Mike Correct. is. Yes, yes. Correct. Right. So, um, so we kind of understand that because I mean, back home, we we understand the game, the history of the game behind it, and when we came here, that history was lacking. So we went through the system as well, where the travel, college, you know, whatnot. Like you were saying, probably back then, it wasn't like really good coaching or were a lot of interest for kids from the inner city. Uh, people from the inner city. But now we coming up, we came through that system with a passion we brought from back home. And not just Mike and I, so many other people. It could be people from Mexico or Salvador or Africa, right? So we're just changing the culture around. I think that's why there's a lot of young people of color that's in the game now because you could see a coach like me that look like them is actually coaching them. So that can play a role as well. And yeah. also like the pay of play, I mean, up here to play, I mean, I don't think a lot of stuff have changed when you was playing. The only thing is the price I've got higher, right? Uh, we live in a capital, uh, capitalist society, so everything is work on, you know, how money moves, right? So that's what it is. It's just that went higher and higher and higher. But also, in, in, within those clubs, you also have scholarships. Kids mm -hmm. now can get scholarships to play as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I hear the I hear about the club scholarships a lot these days. Just when I'm reporting now, mm -hmm. uh, and I do not remember those being a thing when I played. Uh, so, and I that that does seem to be um, part of a uh, a concerted effort 
to make sure that the game is still accessible or, you know, is slightly more accessible, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I think, I think that you make a really good point too about the representation for sure. 